you can see the pixels. You can feel the pixels. No, you can't actually feel the pixels. But if you could, they would be very grainy, very rough. Welcome to Second Opinion, the review show here on the Nexus. This is Ryan Rampersad, your host for this episode. I will be discussing the latest Google Home product, the Google Home Hub today. Okay, the Google Home Hub is one of the latest Google Home products that Google has made so far in that line. So to recap the lineup, we have the Google Home, which is this air freshener cylinder thing. Um, you know, it's probably, you know, the size of a large can of soup. Uh, we have the Google Home Mini, which is a pretty tiny little thing. It's probably the size of a small mouse for a computer. And now we have this new one, the Google Home Hub, which is a little, it's it's not uh, it's not a circle or an oval or a sphere anymore. Uh, it's not a cylinder anymore. It's more of a screen, I guess. It's basically a little tablet glued to a Google Home Mini. So the Home Hub, uh, is a little bit different because it has a screen as its primary selling point. It sells speakers and everything, and we'll talk about that. But the big point here is that it's different now, allegedly, because it has a screen. So let's just uh, let's just go into it, and uh, we'll break it down from the top to the bottom, and maybe you'll see what it's all about. So the Home Hub is supposed to be about one hundred fifty dollars, but of course it's holiday season, which means you should not pay that. Uh, often it is around $99, uh, or similar. There are most likely discounts out right now for it, um, either with a gift card or just, it's just cheaper because they marked it down. At $150, I'll just say up front, that is ridiculous. It's not worth it. Don't do it. Do not buy it for $150. Even $99 feels a little steep for this product, but if you needed it, because you don't have any home Google Home products or you really wanted it, $99 is a fair price. Now, I bought mine during Black Friday. It was just $100, so it was a fine deal for me. So I've had experience with it for about, uh, I don't know, three weeks or so now. When I was shopping, I also saw the Google Home, the air freshener model, for around $80. And it's just, it's insane that that product, which is, what, maybe three years old now? is still being sold for so much and it does so little still but that's that's a topic for another day let's talk about what this model has that makes it different and i mentioned the screen and so let's talk about that it's a fairly small screen at just seven inches now the google uh nexus nexus 7 you know that was seven inches but this feels a lot smaller um it's locked into a uh, landscape mode, um, and really it looks smaller because you're so much further away from it. Um, so typically you have it on a, a table or a, a side shelf or, you know, somewhere out of the way. I mean, you're not going to put it on uh, your dining room table. It, it's kind of in the way if you do that. You're going to put it somewhere where some uh, knickknacks might be hanging out. So you're not really going to be looking at it up close, which makes everything seem so much smaller than it really is. You're going to be looking at it at least an arm distance away, if not more. And you might be even looking at it from across the way, um, which is not maybe across the room, but a fair distance from it. So it is just small at seven inches. It has a pretty low resolution when you look at it up close. You can see the pixels. You can feel the pixels. No, you can't actually feel the pixels. But if you could... They would be very grainy, very rough. Um, usually that's fine, though, because you're a fair distance away, like I mentioned. But it's okay. It's it's not it's nothing, nothing to write home about. The screen itself is 7 inches, and it is a glossy 7 inches. And how does a 7-inch screen ref reflect so much glare? I, I don't know. But it is at such an angle, which is fixed, and you cannot change that almost every light in my house, no matter where I where I tried to put it, will basically just shine glare right back at me from it. So at night, it's fine because all the lights are off, but during daylight, well, I guess during lighting time, so after daylight but before all the lights are off, it is just, just darkness, and that's when it looks the best. So it's very glossy, and you should you should 
you know, not put it under a lamp if you're going to have the lamp on all, all the time. It has a white border around the screen. Um, well, here, uh, let's let me think of a comparison. It's kind of like the MacBook Air, the previous model. So the MacBook Air previous model, um, it had you know a screen and then this l pretty wide, like maybe inch or so, band of aluminum. Well, it was probably fake aluminum, al fake aluminum around, which would contrast so harshly with the screen when it was off because the screen was black and the aluminum was aluminum color. This has a white border around the entire screen. Why wasn't it all black? I mean, what was Google thinking? I know that the default color for the air freshener model is all white, but that should not matter. I mean, Google's obsession with white here in some of these um, products that they make is kind of strange, and it's just sort of um, it's sort of off with the design aesthetic that they could have achieved if they just made it all black. Um, on the bezel, on the top, there's no camera. Um, so one of the big selling points of this device on Google's marketing copy was that we can't spy on you because there's no camera. Well, so first, that acknowledges that Google spies on you. And second, that means you can't use it for video calls, which is weird because in the competitive landscape that we're in today, both Alexa models that have screens that, that do the same thing, both can do video calling. Uh, although with only other Alexa models. Google doesn't totally understand what they're doing with any of their products, so it is forgivable here, and also nobody should be using Google for video calling. You should use a real device for that. But it is sort of a weird omission. Now instead, at the top, there are three dots. Um, two of those things are microphones. Uh, so I'm not totally sure why Google decided to put two microphones that close together. Um, if they've been f spaced further apart, I would have thought that the noise isolation could have been um, a little bit more robust, but I'm not an audio engineer. Ian is. Um, it also has an ambient light sensor, um, which is kind of cool because that way it can tell uh, if it needs to get brighter or darker um, automatically. So it's kind of like a phone in that regard or, or just, just, uh, just a smart display. My house apparently is always dark, my Google Home Hub thinks because it dims the display down to like the lowest level it can all the time. Now you can override it, and we'll talk about that in a bit, but it's sort of, uh, you know, I've always had a hard time with ambient light sensors. They're not always tuned very well, so you have to be careful with those. Um, one final note on the screen, um, barring what's on it, because we'll talk about that. Imagine if the screen were OLED, Whew, the burn-in would be insane. Okay, let's talk about the audio. It is a Google Home, so it's still all about audio, at least for now. So it still talks back to you. You can say, hey, Google, and it will, you know, answer your question and quiz you and do whatever you would normally have it do. So that's good. Uh, the model I had um, was the white and charcoal version. So it has a front, white front, and a charcoal fabric base. The, the the charcoal fabric, like it looks great. I mean, if the whole thing could have just been fabric, that would have been cool. I mean, it looks great. Um, but the front puzzles should be black to match. Um, this isn't about audio, but seriously, Google, your speaker is the right color, but the actual screen, the thing people see, was the wrong color. The audio levels seem good enough for what I do. Uh, I don't watch music, and I don't listen to TV, so I, I don't know. I can't give you an objective opinion on that, but when I ask questions, it does seem um, at whatever volume I have it set at that feels right, it feels like it can hear me and I can hear it just fine. And for some reason, it almost seems like it has a little bit better volume control than the, um, the minis. I think they only have like five volume levels, whereas this seems to have a few more. Um, and, and while the air freshener model has I don't know, maybe like nine levels, 10 levels. That one's levels are so uh, logarithmic, it seems like, that it doesn't, it's not uh, intuitive enough for me. But again, I, I don't I don't watch music. So if you're using it for that, um, I don't know, maybe don't buy this and just buy real speakers in a, I don't, I don't even know what they call the Google Music Cast anymore. So there are some other hardware things we can also mention here. Um, there are volume rockers on the side, so you can turn up and down the volume, uh, which is, you know, nice that it's a physical button and you don't have to slide across the fabric base. 
Um, sort of interesting that they went with this approach this time. Probably a little bit more intuitive that there's a physical button for that. There's a microphone cutoff switch at the top back. According to Google, um, well, according to material that Google didn't put in their marketing copy, but that others put in their uh, write-ups, allegedly this cutoff switch is hardware-based so that there's a physical connection created when that switch is on and it is just cut right off. So if the switch is off, it cannot listen to you at all. Um, so that's cool. Um, so... This is an interesting thing, and I and I wanted to complain about this. So this is the last hardware piece because, really, there's not much to write home about here with the hardware of this. It has a screen, it has a speaker in it, and it has internet connections. That's pretty cool. But here's a weird inconsistency, and Google loves inconsistency. Some of the other Google Home products use USB for power. So, for example, both Chromecasts use USB for power. They don't use USB-C. They use micro-USB. Okay, fine. You know, their legacy products, USB-C, might be three cents more expensive, but it's okay. I, I get it. Um, the Google Home Mini, though, uses USB-C. The original Google Home uses a pin connector, and this uses a pin connector. They don't use USB at all, any type. And so it makes you wonder, what's going on here? Why isn't Google reaching for something like USB-C to just, just force it to be a standard? If they're not going to follow the dream why is anybody else going to follow the dream um and so what it points to me is that google doesn't really care they're just buying some cheap hardware they can source so let's talk about software since the software is what makes this um somewhat of a novelty or at least it should so by default it will do the usual chromecast thing which is where it shows you your selected photo album or selected art curated by google i love watching little art stuff um so I have mine in my kitchen. Um, I have a TV in the living room, which I also have hooked up to a Chromecast. And I will often just leave the Chromecast screensaver on just to see the art throughout the day because it's cool. It has the time on it. It has the weather on it. But it also just has cool art. So I love that they have this by default on the Home Hub. I mean, it, it's just a perfect use case. In, in, in also, uh, if you have a shared album, you can have your family put in pictures into the shared album over time, and it will just loop through your own pictures. And it's sort of like, um, you know, it's sort of like one of those digital picture frames in a way because it is, it's seven inches. It's big enough to actually see a picture on it, although it's not very big. Um, and you can actually see stuff, which is great. I mean, it's cool that you can see your own pictures for a change um, instead of just having them locked away in the cloud. Um, so the Home Hub, like the Chromecast version of the screensaver and screen art, uh, it shows the temperature and time, um, and it also shows a little conditions icon, which is like, uh, you know, is it snowing or raining or sunny? Um, unlike the Chromecast, it doesn't show which Wi-Fi network you're connected to in any of the corners, whereas at least on one of the recent versions of the Chromecast on TVs, you can actually see the, the, the Wi-Fi network connected. Um, and so I had, I had been telling somebody about this, uh, a few weeks ago when I wrote the original show notes for this, although my opinion has changed a bit, I had thought that at night, in addition to lowering the color, I mean, in, in addition to lowering the brightness, um, with the ambient light sensor, I had thought that it might even go grayscale as part of digital well-being at some point at night, which would have been a really cool effect. So... If you are, you know, just walking by at two in the morning, you might not want this thing to uh, be bright and colorful. So yes, the brightness is down, but you don't want it to be really distracting at night. You might want to see the time, but you might not want to be colorized too much. So I thought it might be going grayscale, and I thought that would have been really cool if it had been true. I think what had happened is I just walked by at two in the morning at just such a time when it was showing a black and white picture um with the rotating art so okay so let's talk about how we interact with it other than talking so if you tap the screen once it will slide over um so the the, the curated art will go away and it'll slide over a few different cards so the cards will basically be temperature which is cool because you could actually just see that without touching it 
uh, current given conditions um, as words, so instead of just a little picture, it'll actually say raining or snowing or sunny or whatever. And then a 3D, three day projected forecast. Um, and then to the right of those cards, you'll see additional cards that you could scroll through, which will be um, cards that it th thinks somehow are relative to you. Um, so if you have your Google account linked to it, and you will since you set it up that way, um, it will show coming up, which is basically your calendar events. Um, it might show some recent YouTube videos that it might think you might be interested in, and you know some stuff like that. Um, it might show some recipes. It might show some news stories. Um, so once you go through a couple of layers of these cards, so if you tap through, um, for example, one of the news stories, um, to go back, you swipe from the left bezel to the right. You don't have to swipe the whole way, but it's sort of like um, the iPhone bar pill, um, or I guess the new Google Home um, gesture. So you, you just swipe from the left to the right, and then you, you go back. It's like just pulling the card away from a stack. Um, so like as far as far as far as the content on this device goes, uh, there's, there's not much depth, to be honest. It is surprisingly shallow. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but it is surprisingly shallow. Uh, swiping up from the bottom lets you customize some settings, um, like brightness, sound level, do not disturb. You can also make alarms with this. Um, and then there's an additional settings button, um, in the little gear that you can press to get some more settings like Wi-Fi and stuff. Um, swiping down from the top is really where the hub part of this shows up. It is called the Google Home Hub after all. So when you swipe down on the top, a list of all of the things that are Google connected in your household or on your network at least um, will appear and what they can you can do with them. So for example, I don't have a Nest thermostat. I have a cheap alternative, a Honeywell thermostat, and it is Wi-Fi connected and it is also Google home compatible, I guess. So because of that, I can see the current temperature that it's set to, what it thinks the current temperature is in the house, and I have limited controls to raise and lower the temperature, um, which is probably a symptom of the limitations of my thermostat, but in theory, if you had something more robust, you could do more things with it when you're using the home hub. So if you had some Philips Hue lights, or if you had some nest cam i don't know like what are these connected home devices that people keep having um you should uh you should write us a re you know you should write us an email or send us a tweet if you have a connected home device that you would like to review so that we can learn more about that um so you can see those things on the home hub so in addition to those connected devices you can also see all the other google home devices you have so if you have uh, a few Chromecasts, you can see what those are doing. If you have a few minis and a few homes, you can see what those are doing. They're most likely doing nothing because they're very easy to ignore once you've bought them. Um, a cool feature, which will hopefully bring this feature to light for more people, is you can broadcast to other home devices. Now, I don't mean cast, I mean broadcast. The word cast might be a little bit overloaded here, Google. Maybe, maybe it's time to find a new word. Um, this is a feature where you can say, broadcast and then it'll basically record what you say until you stop saying things and then just relay them to all of the other devices or in the uh in the, in, in this case the ones that you select so that's pretty fun i like that you can cast media music mostly to other home devices so you can use this as a way to stir up music up somewhere else i'm not entirely sure if this is useful um, it'd be kind of cool if you could select which devices that you'd like to play in sync with each other. Although, again, I don't know if that's even possible. I know that the um, Music Chromecast had that feature, so maybe maybe this can do something with that. I'm not sure. Um, a cool thing that you can do here, and this is also uh, paralleled in the updated Google Home map, is you can set your devices up in terms of rooms. So you can have... Maybe you have a mini and a Chromecast in your living room, and maybe you have a uh, home air freshener and Chromecast in your bedroom. You can set up which rooms all of those things are, so they're in like little mini groups, which is kind of nice. Um, and then you can see those 
uh, according to your um, you know device list. During setup, you can also configure, <laughs> and I and I find that I find this adorable, because Google's Google's messaging uh, solutions over the years have been uh, let's just let's just say getting worse. Um, during setup, you can configure what they call the latest and greatest calling solution from Google Duo for placing calls somehow with your phone number. So I don't know the details, but you tell it your phone number, and then somehow it will let you make calls from your phone number outgoing somehow, I guess. Um, during setup, I skip this phase because I'm never going to do this. Now, it's not a video call, even though Duo is for video calls. So if you connect the dots there, you draw a question mark. Um, you can also Chromecast videos and content to this device as if it were a Chromecast. So this is particularly appealing for me. Um, so I have this on the kitchen, in the kitchen. And so uh, I'll often sit there um, at the island and I'll just have, have lunch or have a snack or whatever. And so I, I, I don't necessarily need to watch something on my 6.4 inch screen. I might prefer to watch it on something a little bigger and watch it on a seven inch screen. And so what will I do? Well, of course, I'll Chromecast it to the Google Home Hub to see it just a tad bit bigger. Um, but the benefit is, is it has a built-in kickstand, the little speaker that it's literally attached to. So that's cool. It's a, it's a nice little feature that you can do that. So since I'm here and since I wrote it down already, let's talk about the box. Um, so I bought this at uh, Target on Black Friday um, and it was, it was $100. And all of the manufacturers do this now. They come in these absurdly unsustainable and irresponsible environmentally unfriendly boxes so okay why does google and every other manufacturer insist on using these boxes sure there's some material in these boxes to, prov to provide some protection during shipping and store stacking this box has double the cardboard because it has a sleeve box and then it has an internal box and everything inside is colored cardboard and it all feels wasteful i don't remember if there was any um plastic in the box anymore i've since recycled it responsibly but just just stop it just don't don't do that just just provide me a box it can yes the outside can be printed but the inside doesn't need to be fancy i don't need anything inside just give me the product and don't put any paperwork in it and just give me the product Overall, let's talk about the Home Hub. So it's new, it's cool, it's the first Google Home product with a screen from Google. Let me stress that. There are other screen Google Home products out there. The ones that come to mind, of course, are the Lenovo Smart Displays. So those, there's an 8-inch variant and a 10-inch variant. Now the 8-inch variant is just too similar to the Google offering at 7 inches. And ironically, though, the Lenovo Smart Display has a black bezel and a front-facing speaker, and it's also $150. So it's almost like Google made a more expensive but worse product. Hmm. So, but barring that, the real kicker is that there is a Lenovo Smart Display 10-inch version for $200. And while that is significantly more expensive than the $100 that I paid for the 7-inch Google Home Hub, on Black Friday, two hundred dollars is is expensive, but at ten inches, it's almost actually big enough to use as a screen that does something in your life. I mean, it's not so small that you can't see it, and then you have to get up so close to it. But here's the thing: it doesn't do anything. If you just wanted a little screen Google Home, this is it. This is what you should buy. Don't buy the other ones because they just they. They, they're, they cost too much also. They're made by Lenovo, so you don't know what kind of spyware is on them now. But you can't do anything in this lockdown system anyway. Sure, you can check the weather. If you have a smartphone, you should just check the weather on your smartphone. Uh, if you have a Chromecast and a TV, you could just leave your TV on, and the price difference per year, uh, it'd probably take about three years for leaving the TV on to cost the same as one purchase of this. Um, and you can also just check the weather and view your, your same art as you would. It sounds fine, but if you were really concerned about 
audio quality, you could just buy the Google Home for audio, or I mean the the Chromecast audio, and then just attach it to speakers. If you wanted a smart frame, well, to be honest, this is a great smart frame because, you know, smart frames that are worse cost $70 or so, and this is actually connected to a server so that you might actually have pictures on already, and it has an interface that isn't basically aberrant to use. But I think what it comes back down to for me is you can't do anything in this lockdown system anyway. What what does this get you that a smartphone or a tablet on the counter or a smartphone in your pocket or a computer on your desk or a laptop uh, on your other desk, what does this get you that those others didn't get you? Really, the final part of this question is what does Google Home do for you that you couldn't do some other way better? So you can talk to Google Home? Yeah, you can. Half of the time when I ask it a question, it eventually just says to me, sorry, I can't help you with that right now. Because it doesn't understand that some questions aren't, you know, as simple as how far is it to the moon? Some questions are a little bit more in depth. Uh, and, and you know, for some, for some things that's fine. But when we're trying to say that these products are revolutionary or interesting, but you get roadblocked so quickly with them as soon as you get down to the point of trying to use them. Eh, what's there? The other the other thing that I would say is, isn't it amusing that this is the Google Home with a screen, but there's no browser? Sure, you can read some news stories here and there. Who picks the news? Google picks the news. Who picks the YouTube videos you watch from on device? You don't pick those videos. Google picks those videos. Can you search for more videos? Well, kind of. You can search by voice. Can you type? No, you can't do that. So there's there's a lot of locked downness that is in the system, even though it has a screen and you have the opportunity to use more than a voice system. There's just there's just not much there. So ninety nine dollars is the most I would pay for this. If it's one hundred twenty nine dollars and you're dying for one, sure, I guess you can. I, I guess that's okay, but really and and promptly consider if you even need one of these google home products they don't do anything i use mine for <laughs> i use mine to control my tv i don't use it for really any of the google capabilities at this point i uh, sure i'll ask it for the weather sometimes i could just use my phone if i didn't have one um but controlling the tv is wonderful with this you know you can just say hey google stop living room and it'll turn off your Chromecast stream on living room and you don't have to fiddle with the remote. It's great. What a feature. But do we need it? That's the question. This has been an episode all about the Google Home Hub. I am Ryan Rampersad and you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter and RyanMR and of course on my website, RyanRampersad.com. This episode is registered under the Creative Commons license. Share a like and enjoy. You can follow us on our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. And of course, you can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence. Tech news is dominated by big announcements with big, bombastic personalities. Developers, 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 developers. Sometimes they make us laugh. Yes, I'd like to order 4,000 lattes to go, please. Sometimes we laugh at them. Courage. Sometimes we're filled with awe. There it is. Oh! Check that out. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes they throw shade. Toxic hell stew. Sometimes they inspire. Live, learn, and love. They never want us to forget. Remember that the show's never over because I got one more thing. Now, it's often difficult to make the journey to see these events live. This oh. is a freaking dirt road. Oh my god. <laughs> but we here at the Nexus TV have got you covered. On our show, Nexus Special, we recap and analyze all the biggest announcements and keynote events in the tech world. So come join us as we explore the brave new worlds that await us. Subscribe to Nexus Special in your favorite podcast player today.